Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. This is great. We are live from our homes or our home offices. Uh, being with you is a treat because we don't get to see you as much as we would like to, of course, right now. Um, I'm Carrie Allen. I'm the director of the Vanderbilt Travel, Travel Program, Clay Krebs, whom I'm sure you have spoken to is kind of behind the scenes today, uh, taking questions and answers and making sure we're on track. We are uh, busily working from home. This year has been a little different, needless to say, but feel very positive about everything in 2021. And by our turnout today, I can tell you're positive too. Jim Berkeley and Mara Papathiodoro are gonna speak to us about this fabulous trip, Sophisticated Egypt. Jim is gonna speak directly to the itinerary, what we have had success with in the past, We've had wonderful trips with them, destinations and adventures for years now to Egypt. It's really one of our most popular trips. And Mara is going to talk about the tastes and traditions that are so integral to the success of these trips and how they take you to a different um, understanding of why you're seeing what you're seeing and doing what you're doing and the history behind it. I would call them the best collaboration of husband and wife. Uh, that I know, and uh, it's it's really a great a great thing to be able to have them. Jim is also going to address some of the steps that Egypt tourism has taken for safety in Egypt, and for um, just what they do shift, you know, their focus depending on what is happening regarding flights, regarding uh, destinations, regarding hotels. He has very good up-to-date information about that, and we'll be talking about that. Um, you will know that you can submit questions, and what we're going to do is answer those questions at the end of this presentation, and we hope to keep it to about 45 minutes to an hour. If we do go over that and you have outstanding questions, we would love to answer those for you after the presentation. You can call us at any time, and we can get back to you. So without further ado, Jim, I will turn it over to you to begin uh, the presentation about our fabulous itinerary. Kerry, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Jim Berkeley, as Kerry said. I'm a proud Vanderbilt alumnus. I'm not going to tell you the year, but I will say that it was before 2000. Um, and I've had the great pleasure of working with Kerry for, gosh, Kerry, is it going on 15 years? I've sort of they all roll together. We've had a number of wonderful trips, but I think the, the one we may do the best is Egypt. I had the great pleasure of living in Egypt when I uh, was running the Abercrombie and Kent operation in Middle East Africa in the 90s. I lived there for five years. And Egypt had always been a great passion of mine, but that gave me an opportunity to really dig below the surface and find the kind of Egypt that I want to show our travelers. So without further ado, um, <clears throat> now let's see, without further ado, there we go. I think everyone's image of Egypt starts with the pyramids, and that's what we do on our first day. This shot uh, is uh, what I call the seven pyramid point shot. And if you go with me from the hard, hard right on to the left, we've got Khufu pyramid on the far right, <clears throat> Kefre pyramid with the uh, limestone casing in the middle, then Minkari on the left. Uh, uh, the tiny little one on the far left is Minkari's wife. And then in the foreground, we've got a couple of wives of Khufu, maybe a favorite daughter. Uh, so it's a seven pyramid point. One of the great things we do on this trip is we have some private visits. And we start on day one, taking you to what they call the Sphinx pause. The, the Sphinx was carved out of a quarry. And uh, normally you see the Sphinx from the edge of the quarry. However, Vanderbilt travelers, we take you right into a private gate. And there we are at the level of the, of the ground level of the quarry <clears throat> from which it was carved. In between the paws of the Sphinx are the, is the so-called dream stela, which is about Pharaoh Tutmosis, who as a young boy was hunting in the Giza Plateau. And they say he fell asleep it was hot, he fell asleep between the paws of the Sphinx and he dreamed one day he would become Pharaoh. 
And of course, his father already was Pharaoh, so that was a pretty good bet. In the meantime, so they he carved his stele uh, in about his dream, and here are Vanderbilt travelers uh, from last year, I believe. Caroline, this is your trip um, between the between the Sphinx paws, getting a informational talk about the stele. And uh, and we will have our favorite guide, Khaled Lotfi, as Carrie Allen knows, uh, is a spectacular Egyptologist. He's charming, he's fun, he's smart, he's engaging, you will like him. Now, not every, I'm not gonna force everybody to take a camel ride, but those of you who are interested, look how happy this woman is. She's thrilled to be up on that camel. This is the number two pyramid on the Giza Plateau, Khafre with the remains of the limestone casing. They were all encased in white limestone. If you can imagine what a traveler from 2000 BC would have seen when he came to the Giza Plateau and saw these pyramids covered in white limestone with a golden Ben Ben stone on the top. It must have just been stunning. During the COVID crisis, not sure what we're gonna do about going in and out of the pyramids, but I would think by fall 2021, uh, those of you who are interested in going into Khufu's Pyramid can do so. Get ready, it's a little bit of a climb. And later in the day, when the sun is golden in the west, uh, I take you out to uh, Saqqara to see the famous Zoser's Step Pyramid, the first stone structure ever built, and it's still impressive today. And this uh, is my, fam my favorite Saqqara Pyramid, who knows me after all these years. It's like I see one of my Egyptian buddies. Oh, and by the way, where are we staying in Cairo? Well, this is the Four Seasons Nile Plaza. I think it's the finest hotel in Cairo. My team there call it the, they say, Mr. Jim, this is the no complaint hotel. And this this will be the view of your room. We, we all get premier Nile view rooms. That's what you'll be seeing. The following day, we are going to go into the Egyptian Museum and probably by fall 2021, we will be able to go to the Grand Egyptian Museum. And this is the so-called solar boat, which they have just moved in the last month from the foot of Khufu's pyramid into the Grand Egyptian Museum. These are some of King Tut's treasures. These are the canopic jars, which, which housed uh, the internal organs of King Tut. Some of the stunning statuary from King Tut's tomb in Luxor. And uh, this is a favorite statue of mine, Akhenaten, the first monotheistic pharaoh from around 1350 BC. Later in the day, we visit Islamic Cairo. And Islamic Cairo, they say, has the finest Islamic architecture in all of the Middle East. On the left, you've got the Sultan Hassan Mosque, on the right, you've got the Rafai Mosque. And in the Rafai Mosque, interestingly enough, is the tomb of um, the Shah of Iran, along with Muhammad Ali. More Islam beautiful Islamic architecture. And of course, you'll have an opportunity to get into the Khan Khalili Bazaar and do a little bit of negotiating. The following day, we fly to Aswan. And here is a picture of my really my favorite hotel in the world. And if you knew how much I traveled, you'd appreciate what that really means. This is the, the old Cataract Hotel built by the British in 1902. It's an absolutely stunning location, location number one, location, location, location. And off to the left that you can't see is Elephantine Island, which is where the Nubian pharaohs had their palaces. And again, this will be the view of your room. We are in the tower, we have luxury Nile rooms. This is what you'll see as you uh, go back to your room. Inside of the old Cataract Hotel, and it has a lovely spa as well. <clears throat> no trip to Aswan is uh, complete without a so-called Feluca sailing excursion. And um, it's, a really, it's a really fun afternoon event. We take off from the steps of the old Cataract. We get, all get on a Feluca. We rip down the Nile north. Um, as you can see, he was, he's, he was busy holding on. And uh, then when we round Elephantine and Kitchener's Island, we're into the lee side and we leisurely sail and back to, excuse me, back to um, the hotel. It's a really fun afternoon. 
The following morning, we will take a air excursion to Abu Simbel. Now, these are the great temples of Ramses II that he built in Southern Egypt to scare those Nubians. The Nubians were thinking about attacking Egypt and Ramses said, no, you better see how large and powerful I am and don't you dare come and attack us in Egypt. So this is the temple that was also moved in the 1970s when it would have been inundated by the waters of the uh, Aswan High Dam. But Abu Simbel is really an amazing monument. It, it's, it, it's just completely massive. And, and on the left here, the lower left below Ramsey's large thigh is a uh, statue of his favorite wife, Queen Nefertari. So that's a little insulting, of course, but, it, but you will know that he also created a temple on site for Queen Nefertari. This is the inside of uh, Abu Simbel, where twice a year on October 21 and February 21, which are uh, his birthday and his coronation day, the sun rises and shines on his image. We then embark a Nile cruise. Uh, this is a, a similar to this type of uh, boat. It's a modern boat. And we cruise along the Nile for three nights and there are beautiful scenes along the Nile. This is a classic, the, the classic agriculture along the banks of the Nile, cattle grazing, workers in the field, it's a really lovely cruise. There's some temples carved, uh, rock cut temples along the way. This happens to be in Silsila, which was a uh, limestone quarry. And there are nice shots of uh, Dahabeh as we're cruising. So it's a very interesting three night cruise. During one of the evenings, we'll have a um, whirling dervish show. And uh, unlike the Turkish whirling dervishes who just do with one skirt, the Egyptians of course can't be outdone they do a double whirling dervish. So there's a good example of that. Um, the temple of Komombo is a uh, Greco-Roman temple, which means that it was a, 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 after, a, after, a, after a, this one, we literally moor up and on the banks just above the ship, we walk up steps and here you are at the temple of Komombo. This temple is unusual and that it is dedicated to two gods. And this, I, I love these temple guardians. These are called Boabs, like the one I showed you from Saqqara. This guy is incredibly chic. Look at his style. And he's, he's got a very proud Nubian face. A little, little later on, we'll go to the temple of Horus. Horus happened to be the son of Isis and Osiris. Horus was a falcon headed God. He happens to be the logo of Egypt Airlines, as a matter of fact. And, um, the temple of uh, Edfu is the most well-preserved of all the temples. A lot of them are, are in some ruins. This one is virtually complete. And here we are in the inner, the uh, Holy of Holies, which if any of you are familiar with the uh, Greek Orthodox Church, they have a Holy of Holies in their church as well. And in front of um, Edfu, here's the happy Vanderbilt group from last year. Caroline, are you there? I think you are holding the flag on the right. We had a lovely group. This was in um, late January, early February of this year, just before uh, this excitement came along. So um, now we've arrived in, in Luxor and we're staying at the wonderful Old Winter Palace. So the Old Winter Palace would have been where Agatha Christie stayed along with the old cataract, by the way, when she was in Luxor. And it just has a tremendous amount of charm. And we'll walk along the so-called Avenue of the Sphinxes, the ram-headed Sphinxes to Karnak Temple, which is the granddaddy of them all. The columns, 75, 80 feet tall, absolutely massive. It's a stunning temple. Here's the, here's the obelisk of, uh, of, Cleo, of uh, Queen Hatshepsut in the middle of Karnak. Some beautiful hieroglyphs, look at the colors. This is the god Toth. And I love this guy and again, here, here's the Boab, the guard of uh, Karnak, isn't he wonderful? Later that afternoon and into the early evening, we'll visit the sister temple in Luxor. This is Luxor temple, um, the, uh, the obelisk of Cleopatra on the left. The one that's missing is now in the Place de la Concorde in Paris. 
And it's wonderful to see the temples at night. Ramses, great Ramses the Great, of course, put his face on everything. And uh, nobody is more powerful than Ramses when you go to these temples. The following day, we'll go to the West Bank. And uh, this is one of my favorite, sort of, an un it's not undiscovered, but a lot of people don't go to the tombs of the nobles. But this, this was the tomb of obviously a vizier, very important, maybe the mayor of Luxor. And um, these, are the, this, these are the people they hired to mourn. They're mourning for his death. Um, another temple we'll see, this is Medinet Habu, the, the mortuary temple of Ramses the sixth. I love to go to this one because it has the best colors of all the temples. You can imagine these temples painted top to bottom in their heyday. That's a lintel with the, God, with the wings of Horus offering protection. And along with this Sphinx pause, the other great treat of this trip is a visit to Queen Nefertari's tomb. And here we are, again, it's a private visit. We'll have it all to ourselves. We'll probably do it in two to three groups. Um, but there she is, Queen Nefertari, uh, reputedly the most beautiful all Egyptian, of all Egyptian women. And this, without a doubt, is the most beautiful of all Egyptian pharaonic tombs. There she is leading, the, the guy, on the right is the goddess Osiris of my time, um, and uh, leading, uh, yeah, uh, Hachab, uh, excuse me, Nefertari. After Luxor, we fly back to Cairo and drive to Alexandria. Uh, of course, it's a port city on the Mediterranean. This is the Cape Bay Fort, which was the site of the form former Pharaoh's lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It collapsed by an earthquake around 1100 AD, and the Mamluks uh, took the stones that had collapsed and they built this wonderful fort. This is uh, King Farouk's palace. Uh, it's a stunning place. They were actually turning it into a hotel. It had been closed for years and years, for ages. Uh, excuse me. And now it's being converted into a luxury hotel. They're not saying who's taking the brand at this point, but isn't it a wonderful building? Uh, in Alexandria, they've discovered, they've discovered a lot of statuary under the harbor. And this is, there's a, the new Alexandria Museum uh, features that statuary they found. On the return from Alexandria to Cairo, we'll go to El Alamein, the World War II battlefields, uh, where um, General Rommel was defeated by the Allies. And this is the British cemetery. It does, this photo does not do it justice because it's a beautiful, massive place with I think some 30 or 40,000 uh, gravestones of uh, people, of fighters from the Commonwealth. And we have a nice goodbye from a sweet Egyptian boy who's uh, waving, he's saying Masalama, Ashurik Badain, which is goodbye and please I'll see you again. And they're the Egyptians, this is a very wonderful, they're really wonderful, uh, happy, welcoming people. And his smile will, uh, you'll see his smile many times in, when you travel in Egypt. Now, there are two extensions to this Egypt trip. One, is a post trip and that's to Sharm El Sheikh. And I don't have any slides for you on Sharm El Sheikh, but the Sharm El Sheikh on the Red Sea, it's a beautiful beach resort. And the Red Sea is stunning, stunning water. Azure, turquoise water, you can go snorkeling, scuba, you can just lie on the beach. It's a three night excursion. Um, we had a couple of the travelers from the last trip do the Sharm El Sheikh extension. And then there's a prelude. The prelude is to Jordan and Petra. And outside of Amman, here is the, are the ruins of Jerash. And this is the greatest Greco-Roman ruins in the world, uh, the largest extensive site. This is the gate of Hadrian that was built uh, to honor Hadrian when he came to visit Jerash. And um, it's in ruins, but you can see the beautiful temples that would have been around. This is the Colosseum, of course. Massive columns, Corinthian, Corinthian uh, capitals. Later, we'll drive along the King's Way to Petra. And here we are, um, time to 
Here we are. This is the floor of the church that has the oldest mosaic of the Holy Land. We visit Mount Nebo, which is the supposed burial site of Moses. And at the base of that circle, you'll see MN Mount Nebo. This is, this is as far as Moses got. And from here, he gazed into the Holy Land. And you can see what he saw. Nablus, Jericho, Ramallah, Jerusalem. On a good day, you can see Jerusalem off in the distance. It's only about 35 kilometers. Very close. That's about 20 miles. When we get to Petra, of course, everyone wants to get to Petra. And aside from the fact that the carvings are stunning, uh, it's the rock that it's carved from that make it so unusual. Look at this rock. You could carve anything from that rock and it would look good. <laughs> but here we are, the treasury. This is the most notable. This is the, this is the scene they use from Indiana Jones. And those of you who want to take a 45 minute climb or an exciting donkey ride up the hill can get to the monastery. I actually like the monastery more than the treasury. It's secluded, it's way on the top of the mountain and there it is. And we have here a, a Bedouin guardian of Petra. Again, look at his style. They're so stylized, these guys. Like he's got his Santa Claus shirt, I think. It always amazed me. And um, these are the three happy travelers, Vanderbilt travelers. There were more, of course. But these three were traveling together in a team uh, this past January. So quickly, Carrie, would you like me to address COVID a little bit at this point? Yes. So Egypt, you know, the, the whole world is in, you know, chaos with, with, with COVID and what to do with it. Egypt has done, I think, an incredible job of, of addressing the issue. And they've come out with protocols that are uh, in accordance with the World Health Organization, and they're very strict. So as an example, at this point, now we're talking October 1, uh, effective October 1, it may change by uh, October of next year, but now currently as we speak, hotels can operate at 50%. Now cruise boats can operate at 50%. Drivers and guides are all masked. Everybody has readily available hand sanitizer uh, and mask if you need them. Um, the tombs and museums are operating greatly reduced capacity. So as an example, a museum that maybe would have held 200 people can now hold 100 and they'll, they'll do them in, in groups. Tombs are visited in, in groups of six people and then they rotate in and out. So they're being very careful. Of course, there are no buffets at this point. The room service is encouraged. There's a floor dedicated on each hotel. So if someone happens to contract COVID, which I haven't heard of any at this point, they're relegated to that hotel room and they're put up at the cost of the government, believe it or not. So Egypt has done a really, really good job. You know, not all countries are open right now. Egypt is open for business. And we've had, since the announcement of the two vaccines in the last uh, month or so, uh, the inquiries for travel to Egypt have really, I wouldn't say skyrocketed, but they've gone up. And that's encouraging after having no business at all since March. So we've got, uh, you know, a couple dozen travelers going over the holidays. And that's encouraging. So by the time you travel in uh, October, 2021, uh, we'll have a good indication of how all these protocols are working. So good, uh, without further ado, should we carry on and pass to Mara? Yes, okay. <laughs> now, you know, I think I do a pretty good job, but then you're gonna meet my wife who really is um, ever so much more clever than I am. Here we go. Mara, you ready? Yes. All right. <clears throat> Hi everyone, hello. I'm Mara Papathiodoro. Uh, I am so happy to be here today. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, I am married to Jim, but that doesn't make me uh, the taste and traditions expert that I am. Um, I was the international editor at Bon Appetit magazine for 12 years um, through the 90s. And at that time, that meant that I was in charge of cultivating and putting together our annual international issue, if you 
were our readers, you might remember that every May we did a special issue dedicated to a country or region that took a year of research and collaboration. And I was very lucky enough to be that editor. Uh, the rumor is that I was born clutching my passport. I had a Greek father and an Irish American mother. So travel was always part of our family dynamic. And I'm just lucky and fortunate uh, that I got to carry that on into my career. Um, tastes and traditions are a very important part of, okay, now I can't go down. Sorry. <laughs> I hear, is it here? No. Technical, I'm very good at what I, there we go. What is it, that one? There we go. Okay. So we're going to talk about Egypt today, and part of the reason when Carrie and I were talking about it, culture and cuisine go hand in hand. Um, but the truth is, behind every taste is a tradition, and behind every tradition there is a taste. And what do we mean by that? We mean that what grows in a country and how it comes to be is what we learn to eat. And because that's what's available. And in becoming available, what do we do with it? And that's how the traditions come to be. So we are in Egypt, which if you look at the Mediterranean map, Egypt is part of the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and if you look at how the countries all there look together, connection between cuisines and elements and tastes came because of merchants, whether it was by land or by sea, you can see places you may or may not have been, whether it's Greece or Turkey, uh, Morocco, Algeria, Libya, the elements there all sort of came together. Some of the similarities grow in, the, in countries, but the traditions and the tastes are different with what they do there. And what does that mean? It means the S factor, that's what we call it in the food world. The sun, the sea, and the soil of the different countries are what affects what grows or more importantly, how it grows. And so if you have high sun or, or not a lot of sun, or if you're on the coast, like you are in the Eastern and Western Mediterranean, you're going to have your crops be affected by the sea. And the sea and the sun very much affect the soil, whether it's moist, whether it's rocky and dry. Very different to be on the coast versus being in the mountains. And that very much affects what you find in these regions. And we call that the soul of the taste and the traditions. It all starts, there are five elements that come through in the Mediterranean. The first to two primary elements are the sea salt and the honey. And why is that? It's the sea and the sun. The, sun, the sea salt comes from how the ocean cultivates the salt. And they actually, throughout Egypt, throughout Italy, throughout Greece, have annual salt harvests. And the type of sea salt is very different from Morton salt, for instance, that is processed. This is all natural and it's considered the first, and we still use it today, as the first preservative. And honey, which Wherever there are bees, there is honey anywhere in the globe. And I wouldn't say Egyptian honey, you're going to find it throughout the region, but there, there is Egyptian honey, but it's not as prominent or as established, shall we say, as the Greek, Italian, or Spanish honey. But it is nature's elixir and it is nature's sweet. And both of these elements you're going to see throughout the tombs, because when they opened the Egyptian tombs, there were jars of honey, there were jars of salt, and there was grain. Again, what grows there? Grain, uh, barley, uh, rice, rye, all of these natural elements are throughout the cuisine of the Mediterranean. <clears throat> olives and olive oil. Where there's olives, you're going to make olive oil. And olives are a fruit, a stone fruit, as we know. Uh, they do very well growing in high heat and wet soil. Uh, but the bigger olive growers are the Greeks, the Italians, and the Spanish. But again, they had trade relations with the Egyptians. Uh, and you will find olive trees, but the olive harvest is, again, coming from the countries that are tied to Egypt. And grapes the wine. Uh, I get a lot of questions. Is there Egyptian wine? Not so much, but there is Lebanese wine and they bring in wines from Italy. You'll get some very nice wines there. Uh, but these five elements are the main 
core ingredients of the tastes and traditions of this region. And they are the five ingredients too that you find in the Bible and have a lot of ritual with King Tut, with Queen Nefertari, um, all of those because they have been there since 2500 BC or that's the earliest we can document anyway. The spices and dried herbs of the Eastern Mediterranean, this is where the trade routes brought different tastes to the country. Uh, and again, the spices and the herbs, spices um, that range from cinnamon and nutmeg and the herbs like coriander and cumin, they all came and became commodities because Egypt, for instance, didn't have, uh, shall we say, cumin. And so seeds became a way of tasting and enjoying, but they became an element that went into the foods. And this says it all. Today in our world, culture and cuisine have very much come together. The Mediterranean diet is considered the most popular way of eating throughout the world and more so in America than ever before because it involves all of this, fruits and vegetables. Um, the healthier you eat, uh, the better you do. It is fact that the Mediterraneans do live longest because they use all the elements we've just covered, the olive oil, the fresh fruits, the fresh vegetables, sea salt. And when you're in this area, you're gonna see lots of different things, but these fruits, the pomegranate, the mango, the dates are probably at every single meal, whether it's in a savory dish or a sweet dish. The pomegranate uh, grows throughout the Middle Eastern regions. It is considered one of the holy fruits, the ruby fruit. Uh, it's a friend and cousin of the apple, pom granite and the garnet being red. The rumor too in the Holy Land is that there may have been a pomegranate in the Garden of Eden and not an apple. So it's considered uh, an emblem and symbol of fertility and very much a part of the regal and royal families in the times of the Pharaonic kings. Mango came from Asia. Uh, again, the Indian roots and the trade roots. It's considered the king of Indian fruit, sweet. It symbolizes friendship and hospitality. And the Egyptians very much believe that's a delicious, happy sign at the table. And again, dates do very well in dry, hot weathers and so are a part of the Egyptian desert table. Vegetables. These are most of the vegetables you're going to see. You're not going to see a lot of lettuce and things like that. You're going to see in the Mediterranean, tomato, eggplant, onion, zucchinis, they all thrive in this type of weather. And the Egyptian cuisine embraces that. Um, you'll find them similar, for instance, in Provence with the ratatouille, which is a zucchini, eggplant, tomato, onion stew. The Egyptians do their own version of it. And you'll see that cold, hot in different sauces and dips, which I'll come to in a minute. Lentils and beans, again, embracing what grows there. Garbanzo beans and fava beans. Um, now today, uh, we know more about garbanzos in this part of the world than we ever did before, but lentils and beans will be throughout uh, your meals and spiced a lot with corianders, cumins, things like that. Again, mixing and matching what you have. Jim talked about where you're staying. These are some examples of the type of places you'll be dining at the Four Seasons in Cairo. The dining room is absolutely beautiful. You're going to have a wonderful afternoon at a terrific authentic restaurant called Abu El Seed, which you can see from the decor, really takes you into the Egyptian time at the table. Um, and it's you're going to have a mix and match of different tastings uh, that will have been, they used to be done family style. They now are doing them uh, person to person. So you'll get to taste a little bit of everything. Jim talked about the old cataract. I agree with him. It's one of the most beautiful hotels in the world. It's also where Agatha Christie wrote Death on the Nile. Um, and I love this terrace. And this is where she had tea every single day. She was British. So she had her English tea. Uh, and the rumor was uh, that she loved marmalade on toast. 1902 restaurant, which is one of the most beautiful hotels in Egypt. It's named after uh, the year of the Aswan Dam being built. And Winston Churchill was one of their first patrons there. And it's as beautiful today as it was then and similar in design. And Jim touched on the old Winter Palace in Luxor, lots of pretty views, whether it's at breakfast time or at sunset. And after a day in Luxor, why not have a delicious drink in the bar? 
or a dinner in the 1886 restaurant. Again, sort of uh, showing when and highlighting the date of how long they've been there. You're going to go to Alexandria, which is uh, absolutely beautiful and more on the coast, picking up the Mediterranean colors. Now I get this question about beverages. Um, beer is a very big part of the Egyptian drink uh, menu. And that is because beer is our first drink and actually goes back to the Egyptian roots. Barley, grains, beer comes from that. There was also a historical claim that many of the uh, workers that helped build the pyramids were paid with beer and bread. Um, and Arak or ouzo or pastis in French, which is aniseed. We all know it as the milky drink. As I said, the wines tend to be French or Lebanese. And you'll see regularly, uh, because we are in a Muslim country, wonderful and delicious fruit juices. Again, embracing what grows there, whether it's the citrus or the mango or pomegranate. You'll see juices at every breakfast and every afternoon. A meze platter, which means meze, mazi, together. Um, this has become more of a word in the English language than ever before. And it's really a mixture of hors d'oeuvres and dips uh, like this. Hummus, which we know is the garbanzo bean, which we saw. Uh, you know something internationally has become a normality uh, on the plate when you can find it at Trader Joe's or Publix or Kroger's. Laban, which is really in Greek tzatziki or at Trader Joe's cucumber yogurt and baba ganoush using the eggplants that grow in the region. You're gonna have all of those with the pita bread um, at uh, your Egyptian table. Falafel and tabbouleh, again, Mediterranean cuisine has become more known in the United States. Falafel, of course, is made with garbanzo beans pureed and usually in meatballs or patties. You're gonna find them at uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And tabbouleh, which is very good for you, uh, fresh parsley, tomato, onion, and a little bit of grain. Again, they will be a regular feature uh, and probably as fresh as you'll ever have. So there's an Egyptian dish called fool. Again, using the, the ingredients that are available to you, it's fava, tomato, citrus, and the spices, cardamom and cumin, and a little bit of garlic usually uh, with the lemon and parsley. And fool is really just a bean stew. Uh, every, every nationality mm -hmm. has it, uh, but the Egyptian is fool. And you will see it at breakfast uh, more than you'll see it at dinner. Breakfast and lunch, uh, again, very hearty in protein and part of the working cuisine. And kushari uh, is all, this is a fascinating dish to me. It sounds weird, but it's actually delicious using grains, usually barley um, and then lentils and chickpeas, uh, putting them all together. And it's just kind of a very high protein pasta, uh, again, on every lunch menu and often at dinner. And of course, rice pilaf, which is throughout uh, the region and kebabs and shawarma, uh, or in Greek, we would call it a shish kebab, which just really means meat on a stick. Um, and often at the restaurants you'll be dining at, they take it off the stick, but it's been either broiled or grilled or shaved off of a grilled uh, round. And it's usually lamb or beef. And you'll see it served with the different dips like the tzatziki and the fresh vegetables, the tomatoes. <laughs> and of course, always you're gonna find pita, which is the unleavened flattened bread. And seafood, you're going to be spending time on the coast and there'll be no more seafood fresher than this. Nuts. So nuts do very, very well in high heat regions. Pistachios, which is considered the smiling nut. If you ever thought about it, look at that little smile when the nut is half open. It's considered a hospitality gift as well. Very good for you. Walnuts and almonds. All of these have great vitamin uh, benefits and all had some sort of hospitality and holy element to them because they grew and the uh, kings believed that if they ate certain nuts at certain times, it would improve their brain power and uh, their physical prowess. And you're gonna see these throughout the uh, desserts. Uh, I would say that the honey uh, is the biggest sweetener in the Egyptian Middle Eastern desserts. Uh, and sesame seeds, halva is a paste of sesame that is bound with honey. That's their definition of candy. 
baklava, which we now know about, which is a phyllo dough with uh, walnuts or pistachios and honey, and kanafa, which is traditionally full on uh, Egyptian. Baklava, the Mediterranean regions, they fight about it at the dessert table. The Greeks claim it, um, the Turkish claim it, and the Egyptians claim it, but kanafa is all theirs, which is a pistachio sponge cake that's absolutely delicious. And rose bella bean is the Egyptian version of rice pudding. Um, and rose bella bean was supposedly the mother of one of the most well-known merchants bringing rice uh, to her to cook. And om alali, which is an om to Allah or Ali of the gods, is bread pudding. When you're shopping or you're in the bazaars that Jim has touched upon, there are things to buy, which are the traditional gifts of Egypt, an ankh, which is the key of life, alabaster you'll see throughout, which make beautiful tabletop things, vases, plates, tapestry and rugs. And there you see the pyramids in all sorts of different alabaster forms. And of course, the evil eye, um, which keeps evil spirits away. And again, every Mediterranean country claims them, but it's, it's a fair call. I love Egypt, uh, you know, really, as I say, you know, food unites us, culture and cuisine bring the experience together. And if you're lucky enough to go, I can promise you as well as enjoying the culture, the cuisine will complete the experience. And when I say that, I really mean this, remember that from person to person, dish to dish, culture to culture, the world really does become a smaller place around the table, especially now. So thank you. Thank you, Mara. Thank you, Mara. This has been great. And thank you for all those great tastes. I had great food in Egypt. I had great drink in Egypt. Uh, you will find that it's um, it's just what you see, only much better, you know, in the United States because it's the real thing. So real thing. Um, I want to to really encourage everyone to submit a question at the bottom, if you go down to the very bottom, you'll see where it says Q&A. And I really would love it if you would submit some questions if you have any. I'm gonna pose one to Jim um, that I, I did send to you, Jim, but you know, they've just discovered those new statues and uh, unearthed them the other day, literally about a week and a half ago in Egypt. Are you familiar with that finding at all? There are two things. Are you talking about the the large cache of coffins they discovered in Saqqara over the last couple of months? I think so. Yeah. I think they, um, were, they were heads of gods or they were statuary or something. Well, there, okay. there are two places that they're discovering things right now. Saqqara is like the treasure chest of all treasure chests. You can apparently you just put a spade in the ground and you're going to discover something. So they did they discover a, a late kingdom again, which is uh, after a thousand BC, uh, late kingdom tomb with literally hundreds and hundreds of wooden painted coffins. And at that time they were they didn't do stone coffins anymore, but they had beautiful painted faces. So you, you've seen those on the news. And then the other place they're discovering is behind the so-called Colossi of Memnon, which are two great statues on the West Bank of Luxor, is the mortuary temple of, um, um, oh, I've forgotten his name right now, um, Amenhotep. And a German woman, an e Egyptologist, has been doing a dig there for maybe five years or more. She has discovered the remains of this massive temple of Amenhotep, and they're discovering large, large statues there. So there are two areas that they're working on, Gary. Well, hope we get this. I mean, in October, you might get to see a couple we'll, of those. We'll, we'll see the we'll see the dig at the uh, Amenhotep temple because it's right behind the Colossi of Memnon. That's great. Uh, I did get a question about the climate in Egypt in October. Um, could you address that, Jim? I know, I think people saw the puffy jackets, didn't they? They got worried. Um, first of all, know that Jordan is colder than Egypt. And um, we did need, and, and we had a cool day when we went to Petra. So we were all in our puffy jackets. Uh, I would say it was probably 45 
that was in. Yeah, that was in Jordan before Egypt. Um, it warms up in Egypt. So during the day in, in, Jan in let's see, October, well, yeah, now we're, we're, we're talking a different time frame. October is absolutely the perfect time for both destinations. Uh, you won't need your puffy jacket in October, trust me. In fact, you'll want your polo shirt on when you go to visit the pyramids. October is the best month. It's warm, but not overbearingly yeah. hot. Um, and a lot of the fresh fruits are thriving at that time. October, that's, November yeah. is really perfect. And I found the mornings were cool and then it got warm during the day. So you were kind of taking off your, your pullover as you went through yeah. the day and it was perfect. Yes. And it's dry. So you the other thing, have... Sorry, sorry, Kara, I was just gonna say the other thing is Upper Egypt is always warmer you know, Luxor and Aswan and Abu Simbel are always warmer than Cairo. Right. Anybody else want to submit a question? This is this is good. Gosh, we answered everything. <laughs> Surely we. Um, I will tell you from personal experience, we have run this trip. Gosh, um, well, I've been to Egypt twice in my life. One in like 1984, right after Anwar Sadat. Was, uh, was buried and dead, which was interesting time to be there. And then I went with you, Jim, and I will tell you the difference was phenomenal because personally, I learned so much more. Mine was more independent in the early 80s. Yours offered um, Khalid and Hani at the time too. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, we hope, and I want to put this out there because it is our Vanderbilt way to have educational programming. And I also want to say that we hope maybe October of 2021, a professor might be available. I cannot, I know people ask that all the time. I want to just say, I can't guarantee it. We are working towards that with all our programming in 2021 and into 2022. So, um, but the content that Jim offers on these trips is tremendous educational content. And um, I, I, would you. I would encourage you to go. It, there is no better way than to see Egypt than with this, this kind of a trip. Anything else to say about that, Jim? Uh, anything else on the, I don't want to drag out too long. Ah, we've got questions, yay. Um, thanks people, this is great. Okay, um, great question. Do women have to wear modest dress? <laughs> a, a cake, a scarf. No, I'm, well, I'm just, <laughs> I'm hesitating because, um, let me put it this way. I recommend all of our travelers respect the local culture and dress in a conservative fashion. Will you see people, Europeans, Americans, who come and are wearing inappropriate clothing? Clothing, yes, you will. Shorts, though, well, it, it's it, it, the dress is much more relaxed in Upper Egypt. So when you're on your Nile cruise, or you're in Aswan or Luxor, people are more relaxed because it's a lot warmer. Cairo is a is a more conservative town, so gentlemen city, yeah. should wear just normal trousers and you know shirts. And you know, I'm wearing a, a sort of safari type shirt. I might roll up the sleeves if it's warm in the day. Um, in Upper Egypt, I'll put on a polo shirt. I would recommend, um, you know, no short shorts, no tight, tight tops. Respectable clothing is the way to go for a conservative country. And I, I do mean that um, I'm a big fan of scarves anyway, but scarves and shawls are just good to have. If, as Carrie said, if the morning or the evenings are a little cooler uh, and if you're visiting something and you need your shoulders covered, uh, but you never have to cover your head or anything like that. Uh, skirts, uh, pants, those kind of capris are fine. A gentlemen should remember at the old Cataract Hotel, if you dine in the 1902 restaurant, a jacket is required, not a tie, but a jacket blazer is required. Old English. <laughs> old English. I'll also throw in that each day we get a prep as to what's going to happen the next day. Each evening we get a prep as to what's going to happen the next day. So if a scarf is required to go into a mosque or whatever we're going to go into that day, we're more appropriate, not more appropriate, but just less um, showy clothing might be better. Uh, they will let you know, which is really great. So it's all, you, you can't fail. You know, you're not going to go in and be turned away. 
and you know, uh, Destinations and Adventures also, once you're signed up for the trip, provides you with a list, a packing list, and um, we'll have a an taste and traditions uh, list so you know what to look out to enjoy. So we give you as much prep material as we can. And speaking of clothing, the question was, is there any essential clothing that you think is important? I, I think a hat is important. Sunglasses. Yeah, a hat. Sunglasses. The sun is going. <laughs> and listen, uh, comfortable walking shoes. You know, we're yes. walking around the temples. It's uneven terrain. Uh, it's rocky. It's sandy. It's not hard. It's not hard walking, but it's a little uneven sometimes. And when you go down into the tombs in Luxor in the West Bank, uh, there are some steps. So wear comfortable walking shoes. Exactly. Um, I want to say Bonnie C is on the phone, on the phone, on the call, which I'm thrilled. And she was a participant. And she said it's, she's reliving and loving every moment of what we're talking about. So Wonderful. thanks, Bonnie. For that endorsement. That's great. Hello to her. Best travelers. You really are. Yeah, it's a great time to go. I encourage everyone to go. And I hope, let me see, I think I may have one more. Are there local guides at each stop? Jim, I'll let you address that. No, we'll have uh, Khaled, uh, Khaled Lotfi, the picture of the smiling uh, Egyptologist, will be with us from the beginning to the end. Uh, and that provides a consistency uh, and a level of uh, intellect that I think you'll really appreciate. He knows he, yeah, he, he's, he's a, an amazing Egyptologist and you'll readily see how much he'll enrich the trip. They're all excellent. The other question was, will we see King, see King Tut's tomb? And I would say, absolutely, we're gonna see King Tut's tomb. So maybe you yeah. wanna talk about the Valley of the King and the Queens, Jim, a little bit. So when we, when we go, <clears throat> you're right, I did focus on Queen Nefertari's tomb as the highlight of the West Bank. But when we go to the Valley of the Kings, we'll not only see King Tut's tomb, which as we've all heard, it's surprisingly small. And let me tell you, it's surprisingly small, <laughs> two little rooms about 10 steps down the, down, the, down the way. And then we'll also go to the tomb of Pharaoh Seti I, uh, who was Ramses the Great's father. Now, Seti was uh, very powerful during a very uh, wealthy and uh, successful time of the Egyptian culture. So his tomb is the deepest of all the tombs because of course they had the manpower and the time and the money to make it that way. So, and once you, you're rewarded with an amazing uh, sarcophagus and amazing hieroglyphs, when you get down to the bottom of the tomb. Um, there's also another one we visit, the tomb of Ramses VI. And specifically, we choose those three, King Tut, uh, Seti I, and Ramses VI, because we pay extra for those tickets. And that means there are less people visiting. So we sort of, I want, Nefertari will have on our own. The others, and, and, and Seti I will have on our own. But the others, we have some people with us. Now, when we go see, um, the only tomb we'll visit in the Valley of the Queens is Queen Nefertari's tomb. Yeah. There are others to see, but they're not notable when you compare them to the other ones from the Valleys of the Kings and Queens. And I will say, you know, on the outside of the tombs, you think they're all going to be alike because of the way the structure is. But once you get inside, you'll see how different they are. And Queen Nefertari's tomb particularly, uh, I thought, I would enjoy it, but the colors, the vitality, the preservation is is unbelievable, and it brings to life in full form this culture and its history. Because on all the hieroglyphics are messages and symbols. Uh, again, that's how we learned a lot about culture and cooking and cuisine from those hieroglyphics. Mm -hmm. uh, food historians really uh, revel in that information that was delivered, especially Queen Nefertari's tomb. It's amazing. And I'll also say for you shoppers out there, there's <laughs> always, which we all are, but in addition to the markets where you're doing a lot of bargaining and, and that sort of thing, which some people are very comfortable doing and some people are not, but there are opportunities to go to really fine places and buy some beautiful papyrus uh, pieces, some jewelry, some other things that are um, a little bit higher in maybe the market. 
So there is great shopping for everybody. If you want to bring back on your Christmas presents, that's the time to do it. And, uh, you know, you might even start bringing back other things like spices and things that are more uh, unique to the region that are very fresh and you might not get here quite as readily. So all they things. Package, become... They package them well, Carrie, too, for travel. Yes, they do. I think I brought some back myself. So let me check. I don't have any more questions. Um, it, we've gotten to be at about 55 minutes and I will close it out and thank Jim and Mara for their fabulous time to do this. I mean, I know it's a, a lot to put together. It's so nice. Uh, I thank Caroline for putting this together for us so that we do not fail and for Clay in the background prompting me to, uh, <laughs> when, when needed, uh, yeah, he's my prompter, which is wonderful. So thank, thank you, you all. Thank, thank you very you. much. Well, we'll and we'll do more. Uh, we've got some other webinars in the future that we're thinking of doing for Cuba and for the Azores with Mara and Jim, both two distinctly different destinations full of incredible history and taste and traditions in itinerary. So more on that. And please keep checking our website for the updates on those. And thank you all so much for being on this call. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye. Thank Enjoy. you. Stay Bye -bye. safe. Bye. 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 Bye.